Welcome everybody to uh, the June edition of Cancer Prevention and Wellness. Um, I'm your host, uh, Jeff Jaguer, and uh, we will get started in a couple minutes. Let's let some of the stragglers uh, get on board. Welcome everybody uh, to the June edition of the Cancer Prevention and Wellness uh, Series, uh, sponsored by the Cancer Survivors Park Alliance. Um, before we get started uh, with tonight's topic and speaker, uh, very excited about tonight's topic and speaker. Um, as those people who are veterans of this uh, session know, uh, we do not. Um, have any uh, access to uh, asking questions live. You, everybody on in the audience is muted. That does not mean that we don't want you to um, ask questions. It's just that we will be monitoring those questions via the chat feature, and I will uh, monitor those and uh, send those forward to Dr. Motley. Um, the session, I, I know it's difficult for everybody to get here on the specific uh, time of the day and the specific time of the week. Um, so this session is going to be recorded. Uh, it will eventually sit at our website, which is cancersurvivorspark.org, uh, under the program session. Um, there will be a link that we'll send out via all our social platforms, uh, and we'll forward that uh, link to Dr. Motley, who can send that out to, the, to her followers, and we'll send it out to the various hospitals so that we get the, the greatest broadcast and the most people that can uh, look at this at their leisure uh, and maybe stop it if there's something that they really want to take notes on and that sort of thing. So even if you're uh, watching it now, you can watch it again or you can share it with a friend, uh, but that uh, link will be coming to you um, in the near future. Um, so without uh, further ado, I, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Beth Motley. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit about her. Um, she is a family uh, medicine, lifestyle medicine physician uh, in town. We're so happy to have her in town. Uh, and she's an early example of a student of lifestyle medicine. Um, in her training, she visited a variety of lifestyle medicine physicians around the U.S. with a goal to explore different practice models and see how each had been successful in implementing lifestyle medicine in their community. Uh, she, equipped with this experience, um, uh, went to the first um, session of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which was a small group then, but it has um, really gained a great deal of momentum and respect. And uh, was actually in the first class to take the board uh, certification to become a diploma uh, in um, the American uh, Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, she grew up in uh, Acton, uh, Massachusetts, uh, studied engineering uh, at the University of Virginia prior to attending uh, Eastern Virginia School of Medicine. Uh, she completed a family medicine um, residency uh, here in the Greenville Health System uh, today. Uh, she is a family practice physician, but also a clinical associate uh, professor at the USC School of Medicine, um, a speaker and advocate for lifestyle medicine uh, in her community and a member um, and a mentor for students and, and residents uh, around the country. Um, something else that I know about her is that um, she says uh, forever ago, but in 2005 and 2006, she was also a member of the USA 
uh, skating team. Uh, so an accomplished athlete, uh, while she says forever ago, for most of it, it's, it's, it's forever <laughs> that that happens. So um, Dot Motley, thank you so much for being uh, with us and uh, exploring and, and uh, letting us know about um, diet uh, in both cancer prevention and wellness, uh, specifically a plant-based diet and whole food diet. Uh, so I will let you take it away. All right, thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna talk about kicking cancer and all chronic disease with a plant-based diet. It's convenient that the way we can eat to prevent cancer will also help us to prevent heart disease, diabetes, inflammatory disease like arthritis, prevent gut health problems. So really a more plant-based eating style not only will help us to keep cancer at bay, um, but help us with our overall chronic disease prevention and longevity. So I wear multiple hats. Number one, I am a normal family medicine doctor. I do pap smears and look at rashes and all that simple stuff. Uh, my subspecialty, of course, is lifestyle medicine. So this is the medical subspecialty that focuses on using diet, physical activity, sleep, stress management, don't smoke too much, don't drink too much, et cetera, to help prevent and reverse chronic disease. I also, of course, am a very busy mom. We have an almost one-year-old, she'll be one next week, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, and a nine-year-old named Lilla. And Lilla is not your average nine-year-old. She herself is a cancer survivor. So she survived her mother's cancer in utero. So her mother, Lindsay, was diagnosed with colon cancer at age 26, delivered a healthy baby, and passed away a few years later. And so no matter what hat I'm wearing, I am passionate about helping individuals to fight cancer. So there's always a lot of conversation about what is the best diet and US News likes to rank them every year and there's always so much debate and even, you know, just walking around town, people are always debating right. what is the best diet, keto, plant-based, Men's Health did something about the all beer diet. <laughs> One man drank only beer for you know, two months in a row and lost all this weight. Sure. I it mean, is I an antioxidant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll talk about alcohol in a little bit. Okay. Um, anyway, so when I talk about best diet, it, it really is going to depend on your goals. For a lot of young people, they say that their goal is, is weight loss or weight maintenance. A lot of young people, uh, that that is their goal. They don't necessarily think beyond that because they may not have any medical problems. And if weight loss is your only goal, there's a lot of ways you can achieve that. You can do plant-based, you can do keto, you can do South Beach diet, Weight Watchers. There's lots and lots and lots of different diets out there. If you stick to them, you'll probably lose weight. Um, someone else may be on hospice enjoying the last few weeks of life. At that point, you eat whatever you want. Um, or is the goal avoidance of chronic disease? And that's really where the American College of Lifestyle Medicine focuses. So I was interested in nutrition from a young age, and it wasn't really until I got into medical school and worked with a variety of lifestyle medicine docs around the US that I actually understood, oh, nutrition is not just about body weight. It's also about chronic disease prevention. How can we eat in a way that's going to prevent heart disease, cancer, diabetes, et cetera? And so while it's very intuitive that we eat junk food and gain weight, it is not so intuitive how our dietary choices affect our cancer risk. So the chronic disease we're really focused on when we talk about more plant-based eating styles is heart disease, diabetes, cancer. Those are probably the top three I see in the office. So the blue zones. So this is a project by Dan Butner of National Geographics. He went around the world and tried to identify those regions that had the most longevity, the least chronic disease, and the greatest number of centenarians. Uh, there were areas in Costa Rica, Japan, Italy, Greece. We even had our own in Loma Linda, California. And of course, after this talk, Greenville, South Carolina will be the sixth blue zone. People always One talk about- One of the about, things that's prevalent in blue zones is respect for their elders. 
Ha ha ha. That's so, which right. Is, which is where I'm at, where I'm at now. So yes, respect for their elders and <laughs> more plant-based eating styles, right. which we'll get into. Yeah. They have a list of nine traits of these communities, but one of them was that all of these areas tended to follow a plant-based diet. So a diet that was at least 95% based in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. If you do the math on that, that means less than 100 calories per day or less than 700 calories per week in animal-based foods. And of course, each of these regions does it a little bit differently, but that really is the common theme that they're following more plant-predominant eating styles. Right. So I often hear, oh, I have a family history of cancer, heart disease, whatever it is. When it comes to cancer, inherited genetic mutations play a major role in only about 5 to 10% of all cancers, meaning that 90 to 95% of all cancers are largely caused by lifestyle and environmental factors. There's a high prevalence of cancer in general, but really a small amount of these are due to genetic factors. So how can I eat to best avoid cancer and other chronic disease? We have several leading authorities that all recommend a more plant-based eating style. So how does a plant-based diet fight cancer? Well, through several mechanisms. To start, through phytochemicals. So phyto means plant, phytochemicals give plants their color and flavor and protect them from infection and predators. That includes lycopene, beta carotene, vitamin C, folate, indoles, anthocyanins, resveratrol, etc. So lots of fancy words that can just be summed up as antioxidants. So these phytochemicals, these colorful chemicals in plants are antioxidants. Antioxidants reduce inflammation and reducing inflammation helps to fight cancer, right? So the more colorful your fruits and vegetables, the better. Let's look at this chart of nutrient density per calorie. So nutrient density refers to the amount of vitamins and minerals in a food per calorie. In turn, that makes it more antioxidant rich and more anti-inflammatory, right? So you can see right down at the bottom there, raw leafy vegetables, those are going to be the most nutrient dense and the most anti-inflammatory foods on this list. So if you draw a line right in the middle here, we will see that above the line is our more animal-based foods. Below the line is the more plant-based foods. So if you want to influence your cancer risk with diet, the lower down we can eat on this chart, the better. And I, I often get patients who say, oh, you know, I make scrambled eggs in the morning, but you know, I threw in a lot of vegetables. That's, that's great that we're throwing in a lot of vegetables, but Think about it, you've got 2000 calories to spend every day for concept, not that I really recommend counting calories, but um, we want to spend those calories on the most protective foods possible. Now, lung cancer is very much grounded in dietary factors. Obviously, there are lots of influences when it comes to lung cancer, smoking being a big one, but if you think about it, the alveoli in our lungs work to replenish our blood with oxygen. So with every breath we take, we are bathing our lungs in our blood, right? And so think about that food we're eating. If we're eating more anti-inflammatory plant-based foods, right? All those nutrients are going to go into our blood. That's what our lungs are going to see all the time. Um, same thing with asthma. People don't, it's not intuitive how diet can affect asthma risk, but it's really the same idea. If we can eat a more anti-inflammatory eating style, our lungs are going to see all of those nutrients in our blood and greatly improve our um, asthma outcomes. If you're interested in more detail on either of these, um, I would check out nutritionfacts.org. Michael Greger has some great videos, both on lung cancer and on asthma and what we can do with diet. So lung cancer occurs when cells in the lungs start growing uncontrollably, uncontrollably. When people are exposed to things like tobacco smoke, pollution, or a inflammatory poor diet for a long time, we get chronic inflammation in the lungs. 
And this inflammation can damage the DNA in the cells and make them more likely to become cancerous, right? So again, both of these people might not think of as a dietary problem. And of course it is multifactorial, but we definitely have a lot of power with our diet to encourage our body in the anti-cancer direction. Another mechanism by which plant-based diets help to protect against cancer is through fiber. So plant-based diets are generally high in fiber, dietary fiber, which plays a vital role in maintaining a healthy digestive system. So high fiber foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans can aid in regulating bowel movements and reducing the risk of colon cancer. Fiber also promotes a healthy gut microbiome, which is so important for cancer prevention and overall health. So the gut microbiome refers to the complex community of microorganisms that live in the GI tract. This includes bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microbes. The gut microbiome plays a really important role in maintaining overall health and has a major impact on various aspects of our human physiology, like digestion, metabolism, immune function, and even mental health. So dietary fiber, which is found exclusively in plant-based foods, fiber is only found in plants, uh, yeah. This serves as fuel or food for our gut microbiome. So here's how fiber interacts with the, uh, the gut microbiome. So first, through fermentation. When we consume fiber, fiber, it passes through the stomach and small intestine, mostly undigested, and reaches the large intestine or the colon. In the colon, certain types of gut bacteria ferment the fiber, breaking it down into short-chain fatty acids and gases. So short chain fatty acids, such as butyrate and acetate, these serve as energy sources for the cells lining the colon and play an important role in maintaining gut health. Uh, the gut barrier function is also important. So fiber consumption has been associated with improved gut barrier function. The gut lining acts as a barrier, preventing harmful substances from crossing into the bloodstream. So those short chain fatty acids produced from fiber fermentation help to maintain the gut barrier by producing protective mucus and also by tightening the junctions in between those intestinal cells. So this can help prevent the passage of toxins, bacteria, and other harmful substances into the body. So a healthy gut microbiome is important in order for us to protect against chronic inflammation. And we know this chronic inflammation is associated with many diseases, including cancer. You know, Dr. Motley, some, sometimes um, when we start altering our lifestyle for the for better like changing our diet and that sort of thing we don't get immediate positive reinforcement oh. we don't get immediate results we don't get the weight loss we don't start feeling better but there's literature out there that that microbiome starts changing very quickly oh yes uh, oh yes it does well, and a common thing people will tell me, oh, you know, I adopted a plant-based diet, but I was I was too gassy. I had to stop. Right. Um, that's just really your gut microbiome changing. And sometimes people need to just stick with that for a little while. Um, sometimes I'll recommend a short-term digestive enzyme if people are dealing with bloating or gas. Right. Um, and of course, there's going to be just more bulk in a plant-based diet, right? So you will feel physically more full. Some people get that confused. They're like, oh, my stomach's bigger. I've gained weight. I'm like, I don't think so. I think that's just that you're eating more bulk. So when it comes to colorectal cancer, food comes in direct contact with our GI system, right? So we bathe our internal organs in that food that we are eating every day. So of course, diet matters so much when it comes to colorectal cancer. So this is an interesting study. Um, it's a meta-analysis, meaning it's a study that's looking at many studies, looking at fecal weight and transit time to colon cancer risk. So they found that stool weight varied, right? Some people have smaller volumes of stool or smaller weight of stool. Other people have a much larger weight of stool. Um, and this was inversely related to colon cancer risk. So basically people who have larger stools have lower colon cancer risk. So stool weight in Western populations is low, not surprisingly. We tend to eat lower fiber diets, more animal-based and processed foods. Um, and this is associated with increased colon cancer risk. So to the extent we can eat more bulk and more fiber, that will help to protect us from colon cancer. So the take-home point, fiber is only found in plant-based foods. It adds to stool bulk and transit speed and reduces colon cancer risk. 
Yet another mechanism by which a plant-based diet helps to protect against cancer is just by reducing our consumption of animal-based foods. So plant-based diets typically involve a lower intake of saturated fats that are found in animal products. High consumption of saturated fats, particularly from red and processed meats, has been linked to an increased risk of several cancers, including colorectal, pancreatic, and prostate cancer. By emphasizing plant-based protein sources like beans, tofu, some people like tempeh, seitan, individuals can reduce their intake of saturated fats and potentially lower their cancer risk overall. Yet another mechanism by which plant-based diets protect against cancer is because plant-based diets are lower in calorie density. So compared to more animal rich, animal product, product rich diets tend to be higher in calorie density. So this low calorie density eating style helps people to maintain a healthy weight, right? As we know, obesity is a known risk factor for several types of cancer, including breast, colorectal, and endometrial cancers. So let's dive into calorie density a little more. So calorie density is a measure of how many calories are in a given weight of food. What does 500 calories look like in our stomach? We can see here the fruits and veggies, the potatoes, rice, and beans. These will physically fill us up. Our stomach stretches, those stretch receptors tell our brain we are full and we naturally stop eating. Whereas meat, cheese, oil, not just those, but also more calorie dense plant-based foods or more refined processed foods are going to be more dense in calories and easier to overeat. So low calorie density so on the right, on the left. I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. So refined and processed, uh, that that's just uh, industrial revolution stuff that takes the fiber out. I know. If only yeah. the food companies could sell us like lentils, right. whole foods, but right. yeah, no. So that white um, flour is is not, what's, what's your flour of choice? Well, the closer you can get to whole wheat, the better all the okay. time. Okay. Um, it's always best to stick with intact whole grains. Um, think about like brown rice. Brown rice is an intact whole grain. Uh, it can be processed A into white rice, which has the bran layer removed. And so we're removing a lot of that fiber and those nutrients in the bran layer. Um, but rice can also be um, processed into like a, a rice flour. And sometimes we're just playing the game of, you know, brown rice flour is essentially fine, but the, the gold standard is always the intact whole grain, right? Because we have two different kinds, kinds of fiber. We have soluble fiber, that creates a gel, something like oatmeal, whereas um, insoluble fiber is something like celery that creates a bulk. So when we process anything into a flour, while we maintain the soluble fiber, we do break down some of that insoluble fiber. So I think the key for most people just focus on big picture plant-based. That's more of just a detail item about focusing on more intact whole grains as much as possible. So let's dive into this calorie density a little more. So on the left here, here's our column of some of our lower calorie density foods. These are all 100 to 600 calories per pound, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans. Um, and then as we move to the right, how, higher calorie density, um, of course, that's the meat, the cheese, the oil really needs to be in its own col column because that's 4,000 calories per pound. Um, but then also some of these more dense plant-based foods like peanut butter, which is so delicious, that really, packs in a lot of calories in one little tablespoon. Things like granolas, energy bars, chips, crackers, cookies, all those things are going to be more dense in calories and easier to overeat. What's interesting is that most of the animal kingdom out there, they're using their stomach to tell them when they're done eating. But because we have so many processed foods in the US, we have to yeah. use external cues, like looking at the time, it's time to eat, or um, calorie counting, or intermittent fasting, or we eat because our friends are eating. It, it's weird that we've gotten so far away from our like natural physiology, but if we can stick with those low calorie density foods, we physically fill our stomach up, we're able to use those signals that our body has in place to tell us when to stop eating. Um, so people generally eat three to four pounds of food daily. So if we're sticking with that left column, you know, if we eat the most calorie dense food and we eat four pounds of it, we will consume 2,400 calories. 
But you can see as we move to the right here, those calories can just get out of control. So by focusing on low calorie density, this is a simple way to help us manage our weight because we know obesity is a risk factor for so many kinds of cancer. The bottom line, we want to spend our calories on whole plant-based foods in order to fill ourselves up while limiting overall calorie intake. Not doing so hot in the US these days. We see animal food um, comprises about 25% of our diet. 63% of our diet is more processed foods, whereas plant foods only comprise 12% of our diet. So when it comes to cancer, authorities recommend a plant-based diet and advise us to maintain a healthy weight, limit red and processed meat, eat at least two and a half cups of fruits and vegetables daily, and choose whole grains over refined grains. I think we can all agree on those things. The World Health Organization classifies processed meat as a group one carcinogen. So that's really the same as tobacco. Cigarettes are a group one carcinogen. And they classify red meat as a probable carcinogen, group 2A. So processed meat is any meat that is preserved or flavored, salted, cured, smoked, etc., like hot dogs, ham, bacon, sausage, pepperoni, pastrami, salami, corned beef, and deli meat. People eat deli meat all the time. You know, that's a group one carcinogen. There's actually some legal stuff going on in California um, where a physician group is suing some schools because they claim to feed their kids only the best, yet they have processed meat on their menu. Right. Um, red meat refers to any mammalian muscle meat such as beef, lamb, pork, or veal. So what exactly is a plant-based diet? It is a spectrum, right? On one end of the spectrum, we have the standard American diet, not, not so plant-based at all. Flexitarian, these are the people who like the idea of a plant-based diet, maybe kind of getting their feet wet. Pescatarian um, may eat meat, but uh, sorry, may eat fish, but typically not meat. Vegetarian won't eat fish or meat, but will eat things like eggs, cheese, dairy, etc. Vegan means no animal products, but that still leaves plenty of room for Oreos and Coca-Cola and <laughs> an unhealthy processed food. I really like to use the term whole foods, plant-based. Vegan historically has been a more ethically oriented term, uh, referring not only to people's diets, but often to their lifestyle of not harming animals. Whereas whole foods, plant-based is more a medically minded term it's more positive talking about what you do eat, whole foods based in plants and, and really cuts out those processed foods. So what is a whole foods plant-based diet? Whole foods refers to single ingredient foods, unprocessed or minimally processed as they exist in nature. Plant-based in its broadest sense means 95% of calories coming from fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes. Um, so I always promote <laughs> Whole foods plant-based in my practice. This is what the American College of Lifestyle Medicine promotes, a more plant-predominant eating style, knowing full well that patients will meet me somewhere along the spectrum, which is fine. The American Cancer Society and the American Institute for Cancer Research pretty much promote anything from flexitarian over. As we get more strict with our diet, it tends to be more effective, not just for cancer, but every chronic disease. Um, but of course, we know plant-based diets are not convenient. That's just a simple truth of life, that it is not right. convenient to eat healthy. So, so what should I eat? So Dr. Motley, um, one of the things that since we're probably not going to go back to flour, we had one um, question in the chat um, about oat, hazelnut, and almond flour. Um, are they okay? Are they whole grains? Um, um, yeah, so it, it depends what your health goals are. Um, any nut-based flour is going to be a little more dense in calories. But for my patients who have met their health goals, they're happy with their weight. I don't necessarily harp on them about eating low calorie density. We just focus on plant-based in general. Um, what was the first flour you said? I only heard the almond. Uh, oat? Yeah, oat, oat would be totally fine. Yeah, I think different kinds of flours are fine, um, as whole grain as possible is always best. Great, thank you. So what should I eat? No, this is not a rabbit food diet. 
no, you cannot eat the rabbit either. That's what someone <laughs> asked me in one of my other talks. So what does a whole foods plant-based diet look like? It is not a starvation diet. It is lots, plentiful amounts of food, lentil tacos, grain bowls, loaded sweet potatoes, mixed bean chili, African peanut stew, black bean tortilla soup, vegetable fajitas, tamales, spinach and mushroom grits, rice and beans, collards and black eyed peas, sweet potato, black bean quesadillas, stuffed peppers. It can be fancy if you want it to be fancy. Well, or... it's colorful. <laughs> this is an example of what I ate for many years in my medical training when I was in survival mode, frozen vegetables, canned beans, microwave sweet potatoes. Uh, it got to the point where my I started to have some keratinemia from all the potatoes I was eating, which my uh, attendings got a kick out of. Um, but anyway, it can be done very fancy if you want it to be fancy, but plant-based can also be extremely simple. If someone is looking for simple recipes, I highly recommend checking out John McDougall's website. He's got very, very simple, straightforward recipes. So should I count calories? I do not recommend calorie counting. I just recommend in general, a more low calorie density plant-based diet. Most of my, my patients who do have cancer um, often are also overweight. So if that is the case for them, then yes, I'll promote more low calorie density. Obviously um, not everyone is overweight and sometimes patients who have more advanced cancer may be quite thin. Um, in those cases, we can include more of those calorie dense plant-based foods like nuts, nut butters, et cetera. How about labels? Are you a label um, uh, person or do you um, ask them to look at that? I, I think that labels have been a little bit more lay friendly. Uh, yeah, they're, they're getting late, there. But it's still, a, it's still a kind of a deterrent. Yes. In general, my goal is to eat single ingredient foods or obviously right. recipes that I make out of single ingredient foods. Um, I do have a great handout on label reading. You could check out if you're interested on my website, bethmotleymd.com slash provider tools. And I have a drive with all my patient handouts and there's one on how to read a nutrition label. Um, but in general, yes, uh, ingredients that you can recognize. We don't want lots of added sugars. Um, simply, you can look at the cholesterol content, right? If something has any cholesterol, you know it has animal-based products in it. Um, so simply by seeing something as no cholesterol suggests it may be plant-based. Um, but yes, definitely reviewing that ingredient list, making sure you recognize those ingredients. So what about protein? Common, common question we get. Be careful you don't end up protein deficient. No, 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 that's, that's ridiculous. You will not end up protein deficient. I have not a single patient in almost 10 years of practice that has had any issues with protein deficiency. Um, so it is a myth that plant foods are missing some amino acids. There used to be this thought, um, you know, complementary proteins, if you have brown rice, you need to have beans with it so that you can get a, a full amino acid profile. All plant foods contain all of the essential amino acids. You can head over to the USDA database and look up any food you want. So no plant protein is missing any essential amino acid. There's only one food that is missing an essential amino acid. It is gelatin, which is missing lysine, and that's not plant-based anyway. So we do not need to complement proteins to ensure adequate intake. So um, when you have somebody that's coming to you, now you're a form, you're, you're an athlete. Yeah. Um, so somebody who's practicing for football or a long distance runner or something like that, and you know maybe their advisor, their parents are worried that you know plant-based is not going to get them the same degree of of muscle strength and that sort of thing, or VO2 max or that sort of thing for a long distance runner. Um, are, are you able to, to um, give them information that says not true? Right. So athletes do need more protein. They need more calories overall. Right. Um, and plant-based foods are going to be the best when it comes to recovery and muscle repair right? Sometimes people after a real bad workout, they go take some ibuprofen, but no need for ibuprofen when you're eating more plant-based because that's going to speed up our muscle repair. There's a, an endurance athlete named Brendan Brazier, and that's a lot of what he talked about because he ate fully plant-based. He felt his recovery was faster and he was able to train more frequently, which allowed him to be a better athlete. Um, there's some great groups to check out. So the no meat athlete is 
great, great group to follow. Um, and then also the Game Changers documentary has been really popular. Um, and then also the Engine 2 Diet would be a popular book for people interested in performance and athleticism. The common question I get, what about alcohol? Oh, it always kills me every October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and that means we need to drink more alcohol, right? No, no, you should not be drinking alcohol when it comes to cancer. So myth, it is a myth that some alcohol is protective against cancer. So the World Health Organization classifies alcohol as a definitive breast carcinogen and states that no amount of alcohol is safe when it comes to cancer risk. That's a pretty big statement. Drinking a bottle of wine per week, which is like five glasses of wine in a week, in a week is equivalent to smoking five to 10 cigarettes in terms of absolute cancer risk. So I guess if you do the math on that, one glass of wine is really equivalent to one to two cigarettes when it comes to cancer risk. And so that while includes alcohol, red wine. Huh? That includes the red wine. Ye, um, that includes all, um, all alcohol. Uh, right. Red wine does contain a compound that is protective and works more like an aromatase inhibitor. So red wine contains a carcinogen, but also contains something that can help in cancer. So if you have to drink, choose red wine. However, I, I still think cancer is probably, I mean, sorry, uh, alcohol is not a health food, not going to be good to consume when we have cancer. You're better is off- Is red wine part grapes. of the Mediterranean diet? Well, that included Mediterranean diet. Uh, yes, Mediterranean diet is a huge improvement from a standard American diet. Right. And I think we can improve further from the Mediterranean diet. So when you look at whole foods plant based versus Mediterranean, whole foods plant based usually has a little bit of a leg up. Both, again, are huge improvements from a standard American diet. And for some people who are not willing to go whole foods plant-based, Mediterranean may be a good place for them to land. Um, I think a few improvements that could be made on the Mediterranean diet would be reducing the alcohol, um, reducing the olive oil, uh, especially in the US, so many people are overweight that adds 120 calories per tablespoon and just makes our food, uh, artificially more calorie dense than it normally would be. If you've got a little um, bowl of steamed broccoli, you know, maybe it's got 30 calories, but now let's say you've sauteed it in two tablespoons of oil, that will be 270 calories. So for most of my patients who are looking to lose weight, I don't recommend any oils. Um, okay. So yeah, I think Mediterranean diet, huge improvement from standard American diet. I still think it could be perfected a little more. Thank you. So what about sugar? So it is a myth that sugar causes cancer to grow faster. All cells, including cancer cells, depend on sugar or glucose for energy, but sugar does not selectively speed cancer growth and avoiding sugar does not slow growth. And the problem with attempting to avoid sugar, right? That really is more of a low carb eating style. That's going to mean typically people are going to be eating more animal-based foods. So low carb, while that can help in certain brain cancers and seizure disorders would not be the best choice um, when it comes to cancer. But you still shouldn't eat too much refined sugar because for a lot of people, sugar leads to weight gain. It also makes our food artificially more delicious than it should be and causes people to overeat. So be careful with sugar in general. Of course, soda is not a health food, but it does not selectively cause cancer cells to grow faster. Another common question, what about dairy? So dairy is a health food is a myth. No, dairy is not a health food. And I think this is something that our, our society is coming around on. I mean, when I grew up, even into college medical school, I drank milk because I thought right. it was healthy. And it really wasn't until I was in medical school. I just couldn't believe it. I just, I just couldn't believe dairy was not healthy until I really started to review the literature on my own. Um, USDA is uh, pretty compelling. They do a good job with their marketing. 
Um, so all animal based foods contain some sex hormone like estrogen or growth hormone or growth hormone. So dairy is naturally a hormonal substance. Um, and dairy is associated with several hormonal conditions. Acne is a huge one I see in the office all the time. First time, first thing I tell patients is let's cut out the dairy and that often clears up acne right off the bat. Um, dairy can also present some issues with male fertility, premature puberty, if you think about it. People are, ex children are exposed to greater amounts of hormone at a young age, it can cause them to hit puberty at a young age um, and also prostate cancer. So this is an interesting study looking at milk and prostate cancer cells. So they put prostate cancer cells in a Petri dish and expose them either to organic cow's milk or almond milk. The result, they found that cow's milk stimulated the growth of prostate cancer cells in all 14 trials, increasing cancer growth rate by 30%, while almond milk suppressed cancer cell growth <clears throat> by greater than 30%. That's pretty significant. Um, so casein and IGF-1 promote initiation, promotion, and progression of cancer, right? So cows are supposed to weigh a thousand pounds after a year, right? Which is uh, apparently 17 times their birth weight. And so it is because dairy is such a naturally hormonal food containing casein and these growth factors like IGF-1 that promotes growth in the cow. So that's great for the cow, but what we don't want is to promote growth of cancer cells. So dairy, uh, breast milk is of course wonderful in infancy, but beyond infancy, we really don't need to be consuming dairy. A high calcium intake, whether through supplements or food is linked to prostate cancer. Men should try to get, but not exceed recommended levels of calcium, mainly through food sources. So beans, greens, great place to get your calcium. What about soy? Yeah. This is another common area of confusion. So people often think soy increases cancer risk. Soybeans contain a class of phytoestrogens called isoflavones. So phyto meaning plant, estrogen. So an isoflavone um, is a plant derived chemical that may look like estrogen. So then people think, oh, okay, so soy has an estrogen-like effect. Oh, okay, soy causes breast cancer. It, it is just not that simple. So soy is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, right? So estrogen has an affinity for these alpha receptors throughout the body, whereas soy has an affinity for more of the beta estrogen receptors throughout the body. So soy has a different effect on different tissues. Um, and that will depend on the ratio of the alpha to the beta estrogen receptors. So overall, soy is going to lower breast cancer risk. So that's an anti-estrogenic effect, but also is going to help alleviate menopausal hot flashes, which is a pro-estrogenic effect. If you have any doubts about soy, definitely check out the American Cancer Society, the American Institute for Cancer Research, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. The information is there. Soy, not only does it not promote cancer, but it is protective against cancer. Do I have to eat my broccoli? Yes, you do. So cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, these have been studied for many years for their potential role in reducing the risk of breast cancer. So compounds in these cruciferous vegetables have been shown to inhibit the growth of cancer cells and suppress tumor development in various experimental studies. So cruciferous vegetables may have a positive impact when it comes to hormone regulation um, and in particular related to estrogen. So breast cancer is often hormone related with estrogen playing a significant role some compounds found in cruciferous vegetables can help promote the conversion of estrogen to less active forms and potentially reduce the stimulation of these estrogen dependent breast cancer cells. For women on tamoxifen, those who had one serving of broccoli, cauliflower, collards, collards cabbage, or kale daily cut their risk of cancer recurrence in half, in half. 
I think they should just make that tamoxifen and just like stuff it inside a piece of broccoli and just prescribe oh. those instead. Um, so cruciferous vegetables, not only in breast cancer, in many cancers, cruciferous vegetables are protective. So if you're interested in learning more, I have so many resources I love, but probably my two favorites are Forks Over Knives and How Not to Die. How Not to Die goes through the top 15 causes of death, four of which are cancer related, um, and talks about the dietary science behind each of them. Uh, another favorite would be the China study by T. Colin Campbell, who's really been a pioneer in the world of lifestyle medicine. That is all the slides I have for you today. If you're interested, in learning more, please check out my website, bethmotleymd.com. You can also contact me through the contact page there. Um, on Facebook, used to post all the time. Now I have kids and I'm busy, but you can still follow me on Facebook, Beth Motley MD, and we have a community group, Food is Medicine Greenville. Also just joined Instagram, but I'm like an old lady trying to get it figured out. But you know, you can follow me on there too. Um, do we have any further questions? No, well, I, I, I have some um, of my own, but we will continue to monitor the chat so those people that are on board can certainly ask their questions if they have a burning one. Um, what about, um, from the standpoint of sugar, but what about the sugar substitutes? Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to say anything without knowing the research. Um, I believe, I believe they are not good when it comes to cancer risk. However, I don't know that. Yeah. Um, however, when it comes to, for example, like insulin resistance, diabetes, that sort of thing, even though a fake sugar does not contain sugar, right? Our body is not going to have any glucose to respond to. As we consume it, that taste on our tongue tells our brain we are consuming sugar. So our body starts to increase insulin. Uh, the insulin realizes there's nothing out there to bring inside the cells. Um, so it takes what it can get. And so that can cause people to actually become a little bit hypoglycemic, meaning they can actually have lower blood sugar um, after consuming fake sugars. I think also part of the problem is that we live in a world where food is just addictive, right? right? We add salt, sugar, and fat to all of our food. It's hyper palatable. It's just so easy to overeat. Um, so I think the biggest problem is just really from like a, a food addiction standpoint. Um, sugar makes food, yeah, hyper palatable, easier to overeat, leads to weight gain, leads to cravings. To the extent you can just use fruit, um, dates are always my like indulgence when I really need something or frozen cherries. Also, I just thaw some of those out. Or if it's, if it's a hot day, I just eat them frozen. Um, but if we can find a better way to get that sugar craving, I think that's always better. How about honey uh, syrup? Yeah. So um, honey is a common question we get because I promote a more plant-based diet. The ethical vegans uh, are often debating honey. So from more of a health standpoint, honey, you know, is, is similar to other simple sugars. It's always fine to use a little, you know, if you're making tea or something, having a little bit of sugar is, is not a big deal. Um, the problem is when someone uses a lot of it or really has terrible sugar cravings. Somebody brought up monk fruit. I have never heard of monk fruit. Yeah. Monk fruit is another, um, plant-based sweetener comes from a plant, of course. Um, I, I don't know enough about the research on monk fruit, but I can only guess that it, you know, I can only guess that it's similar to other non-nutritive sweeteners and that it tricks our brain into thinking we're getting something, um, which can cause us to release more insulin. I'm only guessing, but right. yeah. uh, I used to use, I used to use some of those, but I've weaned myself off them over time. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, LC has put in our chat, uh, the, um, uh, contact for the website. Uh, so there's a link there for you, uh, to, to get to Beth's, uh, web to Dr. Um, Molly's website. Um, from the standpoint, one of the first pictures you showed is your beautiful family. So how do you deal yes. with plant-based that you and your husband are trying to deal to do and, and yes. then also, you know, feeding the kids and then you know, Lila does a, a sleepover and, you of know, course. we don't expect this. <laughs> yes. uh, how, how do you navigate that? 
So I became enlightened to plant-based diets when I was in medical school and I worked with a variety of docs around the US that you know promoted more plant-based diets. And I decided, I said, okay, this is great. I'm going to do 95% plant-based because that's what they do in the blue zones. Um, and I actually found 95% to be really difficult because people are like, oh, you're okay with some cheese sometimes, right? You do chicken once in a while. Like you're okay with fish tonight. And I just found it was too hard. We're just not in a society that promotes a 95% wow. plant-based diet. I just said, you know what? I'm just going hundred percent. And and that's, you know, what I did. Um and had my husband read How Not to Die, which, which got him on board, which was great. And with our children, it's actually been really easy for the littlest three. You know, we go to the grocery store. What should we get today, boys? Oh, edamame, right. let's get, you know, <laughs> they're, they're totally into it. Um, we have found a nice balance for our nine-year-old. And this is how we eat at home. We're going to eat plant-based at home. If you go out with your friends, you can do what you want. Uh, we used to be more strict. But then uh, we were sensing some some rebellion and right. even still right. she'll go out and order the meat lovers pizza. But we just want to promote this is how we eat at home. Right. We give her some more flexibility to make her own decisions because what we really want to do ultimately is raise kids who will make their own good decisions. Right. And, and obviously they have the school cafeteria, which may not follow these rules. And um Honestly, while we should uh, have better options in our hospital cafeteria, how would you rate um, the hospital cafeteria as far mm -hmm. as? You know, I did fine in residency. I felt there were always options. I'd often get beans and a uh, baked potato and they had vegetables and fruit. I did fine. Um, there are also lots of not healthy options. I remember in 2014, I was interning for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and they put out a list of four hospitals nationwide that had like the worst quality food and uh, our hospital was named as one of them. Um, it may have been something to do with the menu for our heart disease patients. But anyway, you know, I, I actually find that I, I don't know so much. I don't do as much inpatient medicine, so I don't necessarily see what the patients are getting these days, but at least for us staff, not so bad. And I know a lot of hospital systems nationwide have moved towards providing a plant-based option on the patient menu, which is great. I know a few hospital systems um, now actually serve more plant-based eating styles for their heart disease patients. Don't know so much about the cancer patients. So I think we'll get around. The thing is in the hospital, you know, I guess the question is like, what's actually going to prompt a patient to make a change? Is it going to be what's served in the hospital? Maybe, I mean, maybe that could serve as a good teaching point and a good example. Um, I don't know, is that really going to create sustainable change? I don't know. Right. Uh, is there information in some source for creating a blue zone in Greenville upstate? Yes, there's uh, something called the blue zone solutions. Um, and I was actually looking into this. I think I actually like filled it out and tried to get the Blue Zones team to come to Greenville many years ago. Um, the problem is I think we're doing too well in Greenville. I think they really want the big projects, but right. um, Greenville has a glowing community. I think we're actually very plant-based friendly. Um, there are lots of great groups you can join, like the Greenville Vegan Society, or there's a group on meetup.com called like Greenville, South Carolina, Whole Foods Plant-Based. Um, there's the, we got the beats food truck. We got Sunbelly cafe. So I think our community is, is getting there from a dietary perspective as, uh, plant-based diets become more culturally accepted. I think we're seeing a lot more options. Um, and also we have the swamp rabbit trail. We have all of these wonderful YMCAs, um, good fitness programs in our communities. So, um, I haven't checked on it lately, but I know the blue zones actually does that project goes to different cities to try and help cities that are not doing very well health-wise. But I think we're probably a little bit too qualified uh, to attract them here. So we're doing we're doing too well. That's great. Well, um, I don't really know what our, uh, you know, our actual vitamins. data looks like. I'm only guessing. Vitamins, supplements. Uh, oh, I should have included a piece on there. Yes. The American Institute for Cancer Research tells us there is no shortcut. You can't just take supplements, especially when it comes to those phytochemicals, just doesn't seem to work, right? So those nutrients, they need to come in their original package. It's not just the nutrient we need. We need that whole synchrony 
of compounds that are in the plants. So unfortunately, there is no shortcut supplements. I mean, the supplement industry is a billion dollar industry. Right. And unfortunately, I think well-meaning people end up spending way too much money on these things that often are not much better than snake oil. In my patients who are fully plant-based, I do recommend a B12 supplement. And for a lot of people in the US, um, you know, they may benefit from a vitamin D supplement. But beyond that, supplements really have not been shown to have any effect when it comes to cancer prevention. Uh, the one thing about our series uh, is that we really try to be um, data-based and, and scientifically driven. And all of these organizations that Dr. Motley has talked about are that. Um, when you did your board certification for the uh, American College in 2017, how many in your estimate took the exam at that point? Um, I think it was probably 200 of us, maybe. Really? That I'm guessing, many? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were actually, it was in Arizona. It was at the end of our conference and we were on a t in a tent outside. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty crazy. I got to sit next to Michael Greger, though, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> right. So um, who she just referred to, Dr. Greger, um, his follow up book to How Not to Die is How Not to Diet. And there's some recipes in there, too. One of the things, uh, you know, obviously you do a lot of things. I think you sell yourself shirt by just three hats. Um, <laughs> but how do you, um, wh what kind of recipes, uh, where have you found your recipes? I, I don't, I don't need you to go into any detail, but is yeah. there a resource for really, uh, if, if somebody's trying to get their family to, you know, go towards the, the vegetarian, um, plant-based diet, um, you know, they're going to have to do stuff that's palatable. Right. And, and so wh where does that exist? And, you know, for right. your situation, I mean, when do you have time to do it? Right. So first of all, you never, never label anything as vegan. That's a good way to get like nobody to eat what you right. make. Um, you can start with familiar things. Like, for example, we make tacos all the time. Uh, you can do them with black beans and roasted cauliflower and lentils. And you can put all sorts of stuff in tacos. That's that's a great option. Um, really, a lot of those slides I showed you, I mean, a lot of these are pretty straightforward foods. Um, yeah, tacos, grain bowls are easy. You just put a grain, it's basically a grain and a bean and then whatever else you want there. Um, this one you can see is more Asian style because it's got the edamame and avocado and some nori, some uh, sesame seeds, et cetera. But you can also make a grain bowl that's got more of a Mexican flair um, with brown rice and sweet potatoes, black beans, pico de gallo, that sort of thing. Um, we often make soups in bulk. We also have an Instapot. We make beans in bulk. And those sort of things are just real easy and last a while. Um, I do on my website, if you go to my provider tools page in my drive, I have a handout called Recipes and Restaurants. Um, it has a list of some of my favorite websites when it comes to plant-based eating, but really there's no one size fits all. I'm really a simple chef. I like real straightforward stuff. I don't want to spend more than like 20, 30 minutes preparing food for the family, but some people are foodies and they really like fancy, delicious food. So there's, there's websites on there for everyone. So you don't need to be too exotic. I mean, most of the things on this page are pretty straightforward. For years, I didn't do tofu because I like wasn't into it. But lately, we've started incorporating it. Um, so just because it's vegan does not mean it, or you know, plant based does not mean it has to be scary and unfamiliar. There's there's lots of good food that you can make. Have you found some exceptions to people who have inflammatory bowel? Inflammatory bowel disease is tricky um, because just the matter of transitioning towards a plant based diet, it it can just be very hard on your gut microbiome. It takes it can take a long time to overcome. There's right. a wonderful book I recommend to people called Fiber Fueled by Dr. Bolsowitz, who's actually in Charleston, which is awesome. I've been waiting for years for someone to write the book on, on gut health, especially when it comes to gut health. There's so much misinformation out there. He is an MD and has a lot more letters after his name. I don't know what they all mean. 
Um, right. But he has a strong research background and really knows what he's talking about and also has the clinical experience. So gut health is tricky. And for some people, we need to start with pretty limited diets just based on what they tolerate. And then we start to incorporate more of those. But definitely the fiber field book would be a great place to start. Okay. Well, Donna Molly, thank you so much for uh, putting this all together and the work you did towards um, getting us a really all-inclusive lecture. Um, uh, again, the website is out there. Um, again, this has been recorded. Again, you will get the uh, link to the recording um, so that you can look at it at your leisure and please share this with others. It doesn't make a difference if we can't disseminate it to the people who need it. And the people who need it is pretty much everybody. Um, so next month in, in July, we'll be talking about um, adolescent and young adult uh, cancers. That's um, uh, cancer that are developing in 15 to 35 year olds. And so a special uh, subpopulation and that'll be in July. And uh, as is usually the case, we end with a poem or a quote. And um, this is uh, called Crystal Ball. And it's written by Shel Silverstein, uh, who wrote um, The Giving Tree. Uh, for most of you who have kids, you have read that book. A uh, little known fact is uh, for those of you who uh, are Johnny Cash aficionados, he also wrote A Boy Named Sue. Um, but he is um, a funny guy that doesn't look like he'd be funny uh, when you see his picture, but he he does some some humorous uh, poems. So I, I thought this had some, some food uh, references as well. <clears throat> so it's called Crystal Ball. Come see your life in my crystal glass. 25 cents is all you'll pay. Let me look into your past. Here's what you had for lunch today. Tuna salad and mashed potatoes, green pea soup and apple juice, collard greens and stewed tomatoes, chocolate milk and lemon mousse. You admit I've told it all. Well, I know it, I confess, not by looking in my ball, but just by looking at your dress. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Motley. Appreciate, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great evening. <laughs>